Well, hi, everybody. I'm Rick Edelman. Thanks so much for joining us for this program. I'm excited about this webinar because it hits two of the most popular topics in the field of digital assets and two where they're the most curious and a lot of questions from advisors. Understanding NFT funds and tickerized crypto trusts. Helping us delve into these are my good friend, Greg King. He is a CFA and the founder and CEO of Osprey Funds. Greg, uh, join us on the program. Thanks so much for being with us. Greg is uh, an expert in crypto and an innovator in this space, launched over 100 ETFs uh, and founded RecShares, which a lot of you, uh, that's a name a lot of you know. And he's been engaged in the uh, Bitcoin space since 2013, so quite a long time. Greg, welcome to the program. Great to be here, Rick, as always. Tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about Osprey and uh, let make sure everybody understands uh, what Osprey does. Sure. So yeah, as you mentioned, I, I, I founded uh, Rex Shares about six years ago, uh, focused on uh, launching ETFs and uh, in alternative strategies and, you know, had invested in Bitcoin just in my personal account, but really didn't see those two worlds converging until a bit later. So um, in 2016 and 17, we filed for a Bitcoin ETF, um, but, uh, you know, met with the same result that a lot of people met with. And so I, I started Osprey actually as a result of that in 2018, uh, gave it a separate brand and just um, realized that the opportunity for creating crypto access investment products was just going to be so large, it really needed to be a standalone company. So Osprey and, and RexShares are actually two separate companies now. Um, uh, my main focus is, is running and building Osprey. And the goal is, you know, my background is ETFs. Um, I love uh, the, the whole idea of democratizing investment landscapes for uh, investors to have access. Um, and the ETPs, you know, exchange traded products are a great way to do that. So that's how we got started. Um, you know, our first uh, fund is OBTC, which is a Bitcoin fund. And we've launched several other single asset trusts, what we call them. But we, we pretty quickly realized that in terms of delivering uh, value to investors in the space of crypto, you really need to offer a lot of different um, access points. And primarily that's because the underlying asset class is, is evolving so rapidly. And also because the regulatory environment um, in a lot of cases really hasn't caught up. Um, so we've, we've got single asset trust, which are about the most beta product you could have. Um, it's, it's, it's like a, just to show you how early it is for the space, it's like creating a single stock fund. I mean, you would never do that in the stock world, but it's, it's almost necessary right now to form uh, some of the building blocks for investment strategies. Um, but you also need, we feel you need alpha products because the space is so uh, nascent and there's a lot of navigating to be done. So we're launching our first alpha fund here uh, momentarily, which we'll get into. Um, and then kind of in the middle, which probably the audience is the most familiar with are um, index products, right? Not active and, and certainly not single asset, but index products. And I actually think that is one of the most challenging areas of crypto right now. Uh, because it is so new, it's really difficult to index. And because of the regulatory environment, at least in the US, it's very difficult to create um, uh, investments that are not, let's call it tax disadvantaged. So we are certainly working on, on indexed ideas uh, and hope to have something in the near future, but that is kind of the last mile for us uh, to have the full suite of product. Anyway, it's great to be here, Rick. And, and that's a wonderful overview and intro for us uh, all because uh, there is a lot of confusion about all this space, a lot of interest in it, as we've cited. Osprey is pr pretty much at ground zero in, in the heart of things of dealing with it. So we're going to tackle all of these subjects uh, in this conversation. And it's going to be largely Q&A driven from the advisors who have registered for this event. A, a lot of you have sent in questions in advance. Thank you all very much. And I'm going to be uh, engaging my conversation with Greg based on the questions that you have already submitted. But all is not lost. If you didn't send in any questions yet, or if something new pops into your head, you have an opportunity to post your question right now. You can go to the question, the, the Q&A uh, uh, box on your Zoom screen and post in your question there. I will be looking at that uh, throughout the webinar today and questions that are, uh, I think, of interest to everybody and germane to the conversation. I will get to as many of them as we possibly can. And in fact, if history is any guide, we do a lot of these webinars. It is, um, uh, you're not bashful. <laughs> you're going to ask us a lot of great questions. So let me 
um, just jump right into it. We're going to begin first talking about these um, uh, tickerized crypto trusts, and then we're going to talk about NFTs. Uh, and, and NFTs, I'm kind of saving the best for last because that's where there's so much uh, curiosity and advisor questions about that marketplace. So, so let's begin, Greg, with talking about uh, trusts. Um, we know that the holy grail of the investment world are ETFs. Um, that is the most popular investment vehicle that exists, trillions of dollars of assets. They had inflows of over a trillion dollars last year alone. More money flowed into ETFs last year than into mutual funds. Mutual funds still hold more money, but that's only because of inertia. They've been around for you know, uh, 80 years now. Um, ETFs have only been around for, for 20. Uh, and so they've gotten a big head start, but the net outflows have uh, risen to the point where that's more than the net inflows of mutual funds. It's all about ETFs. The problem is there is no crypto ETF. There's no Bitcoin ETF yet. The SEC still is not yet said yes to a Bitcoin ETF. Osprey, you have filed uh, an application uh, for uh, that product, but it doesn't exist yet. And we'll talk later about your predictions of how long it's gonna take yeah. for that to become reality. But in the meantime, all is not lost. The SEC does have a methodology that it does allow products to come to market and they are OTC listed trusts. Um, so mm -hmm. they are the, you know, the next best thing. Uh, they aren't everything that an ETF is, but in the absence of a, a, an allowance of an ETF, this allows us to play the game. So talk about what these OTC listed trusts are mm -hmm. and how they work and how they compare to an ETF. Yeah, um, there's a lot of history baked into that, uh, you know, opening statement. Um, it's actually been almost nine years since the Winklevoss twins first filed uh, a Bitcoin ETF application. That was 2013, if you can believe that, um, which is probably the reason Bitcoin even made my radar, to be honest, back then. But, um, you know, the way that the uh, landscape has evolved, um, the trust structure is uh, what people are utilizing as an exchange traded product. However, that, that even just sort of saying that, saying it that way is a bit misleading because it's really not the trust structure that's any different. As a matter of fact, you know, whether it's our trust or someone else's, well, I shouldn't speak to other people's, but our trust could easily be converted to an ETF as is. You don't actually have to change the structure of the investment. It's really just whether the regulators allow for for you to trade as an ETF. And that involves a couple different exemptions that are you know, fairly, fairly technical. Um, but in the case where that's not possible, you can still trade things OTC. I mean, that's initially what the OTC market started off as, you know, foreign stocks, you know, penny stocks, uh, kind of the miscellaneous bucket, if you will. I think over the last five or 10 years, we've seen not only with crypto trusts being listed, but also with um, foreign uh, Chinese companies, we, you, we've seen some OTC stocks and listings that are uh, relatively huge. Back in the day, it used to be just tiny names and, you know, tiny, you know, two cents a share and $12 million market cap. And now you're seeing tens of billions in market cap and, you know, 50 bucks a share. And it, it sort of looks like a, a quote unquote normal market, but it still is the OTC market. And um, it's actually been improved quite a bit in terms of the uh, plumbing. I really had no experience with the OTC market until four years ago when we started researching this. And my, my experience, like you said, I've launched over 100 ETFs is on the New York Stock Exchange and, and the NASDAQ and, uh, you know, BATS or now SIBO. But um, the OTC market process is, is, you know, significantly more arcane. So it's a little um, sort of more, more hoops to jump through than, than launching a, a fund on the New York, let's say. Um, but it, you know, it ultimately kind of works. And so we saw the landscape, we saw that that was the only uh, route to market. And we thought that we could add some value by creating a competitive product to what was already out there, you know, lower price point. I come from kind of the ETF iShare school of thought and, um, you know, understand that uh, RIAs are always looking, you know, only believe in a few certainties. I think it's death taxes and the only free lunch is, is diversification or lowering fees. Um, so we tried to, to build a product that um, could help in that regard. Um, but it's, it's kind of a, a, an interesting case study. I think 10 years from now, people will look back and wonder, you know, 
why wasn't the, the regulatory landscape kind of opened up more quickly? And I think there are some good reasons to that. I think the SEC has certainly been thoughtful about it and not succumb to pressure, whether it's from, you know, uh, other countries that approve ETFs or, or really just different constituencies. Um, you know, they have a rationale as to why they're not doing it. Um, and we'll see how that develops over time. So let's talk about the, the tactical element. Get, you know, pick one of your OTC trusts. Name one off the top of your head that you would like to use as our example in this hmm. journey. Yeah. Well, so we have uh, part of the life cycle of an OTC trust is that you have to seed the thing under private placement rules. And that means you're selling to accredited investors directly um, at the net asset value. And then basically have to incubate it, for lack of a better term, for about a year before you can get a ticker symbol. So our first trust um, to launch with a ticker symbol was OBTC, it's Bitcoin, um, and, and that was in Q1 of last year. So we're basically a year out from that. And in Q2 of last year and Q3, we, we seeded four additional trusts. So those haven't made it to ticker land yet. Um, that's, uh, you know, Polkadot and, and uh, Solana, et cetera. Um, and so let's just talk about OBTC because that's for us the Great. only one that's traded right now. And, and that, that makes perfect sense. So a year ago, you launched uh, a trust, uh, a closed product, meaning a private placement available mm -hmm. only to accredited investors. The minimum investment amount is? Uh, it's, for us, we were doing it at $10,000. Okay. So you've got to be an accredited investor investing $10,000 into the fund. And if you had done it uh, a year ago, you had to wait a whole year before your investment became liquid, before you were able to trade it in the open market. So now here we are a year later, and that lockup period is over. And those shares of that trust now trade over the counter. They trade OTC, which means if I've got a brokerage account, say a Charles Schwab, I can buy OBTC in the open marketplace, just like I would trade stocks or ETFs in my brokerage account, I can trade uh, this as well. That's right. simple, right? Yeah, it is. It is. I think the key piece of um, information, though, that that uh, that investors need to understand is that because of this one year period in between, it's it's sort of the opposite of just in time inventory. You know, uh, for companies, it's like, oh, hey, we ran out of Kleenex. Well, quick. You know, tell the supplier and it'll be here by the time we open up tomorrow morning. You know, this is the opposite of that, where you basically have a one year lag between, uh, you know, the, the, the supply arriving to fulfill the demand that you have. And so by definition, there's going to be this kind of seesaw effect where the supply in March of 2021 versus the demand of March of 2021 will have to be matched up with, with uh, the the supply and demand of March of 2022. And, and that's the unfortunate part about just the kind of uh, uh, limitations that are in place right now from a regular- so let's elaborate on that because that's a hugely important point. But before we get to that, I wanna make sure that everybody's clear on one point. As you can buy the shares in the open marketplace in the OTC market via your, say your Schwab brokerage account or you know any, any brokerage account anywhere, you no longer have to be an accredited investor. You no longer have to buy $10,000 worth. You're buying shares in the open market. Anybody with a brokerage account can do this in any dollar amount. I mean, you, you can buy right. one share, you know? So right. this eliminates that account minimum. It eliminates the accredited investor requirement and it eliminates uh, the lockup period because now it's liquid in the OTC marketplace, right? So that is the benefit of those closed shares that the accredited investor buys. A year later, they trade OTC. Anybody, anywhere, any amount, any time can buy, right? So, yeah, I mean, a few caveats to that in the sense that certain brokerage platforms, for example, don't, uh, you know, allow trading of crypto related products, et cetera, et cetera. But subject to the usual caveats like that, yes, that's correct. So it basically graduates uh, one year later to, to being kind of open for all in terms of in terms of trading and that's an and, now, and now let's go back to your key point which is hugely important for everybody to understand the supply demand thing you talked about when you are buying and selling the shares in the over the counter market you're buying and selling with a counterparty if i'm the buyer i'm buying from a seller if i'm the seller i'm selling to a buyer right there's the two of us and we are 
negotiating between ourselves as to the price we're setting for these shares. And that price that the two of us agree to may or may not be the same as Bitcoin's price at the moment. Exactly right. right. Exactly right. So it, it winds up trading sort of like a closed end fund. Um, and that means typically a premium or a discount. And uh, the, the, the space, the whole landscape uh, traded at substantial premiums. And depending on which trust you're looking at, um, you know, there was uh, premiums that were um, over 100%. Um, it just so happens that now, given recent market drawdowns and kind of what I would say, at least in, in Bitcoin and probably Ethereum, uh, became an oversupply, um, it, trade these products traded at a discount. Now, you know, one, what's the phrase? One man's feast is another man's famine. That's not it. Something like that. One but, man's uh, <laughs> feast is another man's famine or something along those lines. Uh, yeah. It also occurs to me that that phrase has not been uh, PC'd. For 2022. <laughs> yeah, but anywho, uh, the um, the point is, well, guess what? Now, uh, you know, investors who perhaps purchased at an NAV, uh, a flat NAV uh, a year ago, you know, are going to be disappointed that the secondary market is trading at a premium. Oh, uh, sorry, trading at a discount. They would be happier if it were trading at a premium. Conversely, secondary market investors are going to be happy that it's trading at a discount. Uh, they would be more disappointed if it were trading at a premium. So you always basically have half the people uh, satisfied and the other half not so satisfied. So, so let's make sure people really understand the implication here. As you pointed out, uh, a year ago or maybe six, eight months ago, uh, these trusts were often trading, as you said, a 100% premium, which means people were paying $2 to buy a dollar's worth of Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, and frankly, it's because they really didn't understand what they were doing. Um, they didn't understand how these trusts worked and they, they just didn't get it. Now, because of the larger supply of the shares of these OTC trusts, relative to the demand, they're trading at a discount of 10, 15, 20%, depending on the day, depending on the trust, which means you can buy a dollar's worth of Bitcoin for 85 cents. This is great right. news today for right. people who are interested in your OTC trust. What right. happens, Greg, if, uh, as you said, you're going to be able to convert your trust from their trust status into an ETF status when the SEC gives the green light. What happens to that discount when that occurs? Yeah, this is where the lawyers come in from the side and tackle me uh, <laughs> before I can get a word out. Um, so just to just to kind of uh, further illustrate your point, um, you know, our trust, I looked at it before the show, is uh, at a 21% discount today, right? So to the extent that that converges to NAV, uh, you know, you're you're basically buying Bitcoin for 79 cents on the dollar uh, currently. If we wave a magic wand and tomorrow it's it's an ETF, well, more than likely it's trading at a, uh, a basically flat, right? I mean, that's that's the advantage of of the ETF structure is it's arbitrageable by market participants. Why? Because you have the daily ability to create or redeem shares and hedge versus the underlying stock, or in this case, Bitcoin, and that keeps the price tight. So yes, if we're able to um, uh, wave this magic wand and, and get an ETF uh, approved and converted, uh, then I would expect that it would trade at, at, you know, to use a bond term, par. Which would suggest that you're gonna have, in that example, a 21% increase in price the day it becomes an ETF, regardless of Bitcoin's movement itself. Yeah, Some versus- people Versus now, this is where the lawyers tackle you because of that statement. I just made. <laughs> um, but well, I would simply say thing. that some people consider this an arbitrage play, that why mm -hmm. pay a dollar for a dollar of Bitcoin when you can pay 79 cents for a dollar of Bitcoin and then sit back and wait for the SEC to allow an ETF conversion and wait for Osprey to then implement that ETF conversion. And all the while, you're hoping that that discount doesn't grow uh, and, yeah. and get worse, yeah. which is and, a risk. And that's, yeah, that's actually another... Uh, you know, point that, that we can make, you said something earlier about folks buying at a premium, maybe didn't know what they were doing. And that may or may not be true. I, I can tell you right now that I bought uh, the competitor's product in my IRA four or five years ago, and it was at a significant premium. Um, and why did I do that? Because it's the only way I could get access in my, in my IRA, A. B, 
uh, since we have our magic wands out, if you if you wave a magic wand and hold the premium flat to infinity, it actually makes no difference at all. Then it's a perfect tracking vehicle to Bitcoin, right? If it if something had a 32% premium on it forever and ever, amen, you know, as long as you could trade in the secondary market at that premium, it would track the price of Bitcoin uh, quite well. So it's really the the waxing and waning of the premium itself that's problematic or discount. Right. And, and, if, and if advisors are kind of freaking out about this premium discount feature, just remember, that's really no different than in a closed end mutual fund. And, and advisors are well familiar with those products. I mean, clearly yeah. to the, the, the spreads here are bigger than you typically find in a closed end fund, mm -hmm. but it's a, pretty much the same, the same concept. So we've right. got a question here from one of our uh, uh, financial advisors who's watching this, and they're asking a really relevant question to this context. Given the fact that there is at the moment a difference between the NAV and the value of Bitcoin because of the premium discount feature. And since the trust only buys one asset, you know, like you said, it's a mutual fund with one stock in it, you know, it only buys Bitcoin, then what's the point? What, why would somebody choose to buy uh, the Osprey Bitcoin Trust, OBTC? Why would they buy that instead of just going out and buying Bitcoin from, I don't know, a Coinbase account. Sure, yeah. Uh, so that, I mean, that was a question that we asked ourselves in the first place uh, before even creating the product. And um, the answer is just simply access. So, you know, life is full of constraints. Um, you want things in different packaging depending up, upon your circumstances. You know, I have a Coinbase account. I buy Bitcoin there. I also own uh, our trust. Um, and, and why? Because I have certain cash that's available to to wire out to, you know, kind of like a discretionary type, uh, you know, fun account like my crypto account. Uh, I have others, uh, you know, savings that are in my brokerage and IRA accounts that's really not going to leave the system. And so when, when we looked at that um, sort of pool of assets, you know, you're talking uh, $30, $40 trillion at this point, um, and it's, um, it's really not going to leave. It, it's also something that your advisor, um, which you know most of the people on the call, I imagine are advisors, um, can can monitor, right? Because um, you know, and there's building going on all over the ecosystem, right? So pipes and plumbing are are being connected, and and who knows what the future landscape looks like. But uh, for now, I think it's pretty difficult for RAs to monitor crypto holdings if they're not held within a traditional sort of brokerage account. And this is a vehicle that enables that, um, especially now. I mean. From where I sit, and this is obviously, uh, you know, biased, but um, to me, uh, buying these things at a discount in a in a retirement account, um, you know, if you're if you're interested in getting long this exposure, uh, seems like a a pretty good option to consider. So um, I, I think it's really just about access is the reason for creating funds that can live within the the tradfi ecosystem. Two last questions on this subject, and then we're going to move to NFTs. One just popped up, uh, a clarifying question from one of our attendees who wants just to clarify, when you talk about a discount, right now you mentioned a 21% discount from right. the price of Bitcoin. You're comparing the current share price of the trust to the current price of Bitcoin. You're not, you're not looking at last year's share price when oh, yeah. the accredited investor bought it. No, no, no. This is in real time, you know, daily or even intraday. And, and so, of course, you know, the trust doesn't trade at $42,000 a share, right? It's this, each, each share does not hold one Bitcoin, but it holds pro rata. It's, it's portion of a, of a Bitcoin. And so, yes, we're just talking about, um, you know, the, the, the number of Bitcoin held by the trust um, and the value of that Bitcoin uh, let's say is a hundred, the share price of all the shares outstanding put together is, you know, 79 at this point. Got it. And the, the last question that we had one of our advisors ask, there are other competing products in this uh, uh, trust space, uh, Grayscale and Bitwise, uh, in addition to Osprey. So they, the, the question is compare and contrast. Why would somebody buy the Osprey Bitcoin trust as opposed to the Grayscale? For example, Bitcoin trust, or uh, and so on. So I sure, yeah, yeah, and I do, I do think you you have to um, look at the underlying, right? So, 
if you're saying if you're comparing apples to apples, then it makes sense. Um, there are a lot of well, not a lot. There's a few different products out there, uh, but on the Bitcoin side, it's really just ours and and Grayscale's. Um, you know, I think Grayscale's. You know, they did a great job initially launching and creating this product and really kind of innovating a way that investors could gain access. Um, again, some of the regulatory environment has contributed to the, you know, the difficulty of these products. But at the end of the day, it's just theirs is quite a bit more expensive. Um, so we have a 49 basis point management fee uh, with the, you know, trust expenses. I think we projected that to be around 25 or 30 basis points additional. So all in 79, and I know it's, it's going down from there. Um, whereas I believe it's 200 basis points management fee uh, for the other product. Um, so yeah, so you know, investors have have a choice there, and um, we tried to you know construct our product in a way that was as transparent as possible. There's a lot of nitty gritty in the detail of the pricing uh, memorandum. If you go do subscribe for for shares, but at this point, it makes more sense to purchase on the secondary market from a price perspective, simply because it's at a discount. Okay, let's move over to the NFT conversation. Sure. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> Here's, here's the question that an advisor asked. I don't get it. Why have NFTs become so popular? Uh, you're not alone. That? You're not alone. First, <laughs> uh, first words uh, for you. Uh, I didn't get it either. I, I still don't know that I get it, get it, but I'm starting to get it. Um, let's see, where to begin? Uh, so, so what's the question? Why, the question is, uh, why have they become so popular? Yeah, and, and I'll add on a second question that another advisor asked because they're kind of fitting in the same theme. What makes them an attractive investment? Yeah, okay. Well, there's a lot a lot to unpack in there. Um, so first of all, I think an important concept to get across and to remind ourselves of is that part of what makes NFTs um, so, let's say, confusing um, is that uh, they're not a thing, right? We can't, it's like when Bitcoin first came out, it's not a thing, we can't uh, nail it to the ground, we can't pick it up and take it with us. Um, it, it's not a physical object, an NFT is intangible. But guess what? Uh, you probably know this off the top of your head, Rick, but what, what's the value uh, of the S&P 500 market cap? What percentage is attributable to intangible assets? Sorry to put you on the spot. I would not know. I, I if you don't know, I, I, and I this is just a big number. Huh? Can't imagine it's a big number. It's ninety percent. Seriously, to intangibles. Yeah, yeah. Because is that because of the financial services industry? When you're talking, well, it, it measures uh, things like brand value, things like uh, data. You know, if you think about Facebook, it's it's all about like information. These are all intangibles, right? So, yeah, okay. um, it's not to say that they're not assets. They're very much assets, but at the end of the day, they are intangibles. They're not yeah. tractors and buildings and right. you know stores and shoes and things like that. So, ninety percent of the S and P five hundred's market cap is attributed to intangible assets. Um, so that's that's number one to, to to just remind ourselves: Hey, intangibles have value. Okay, uh, brands have value. The Nike swoosh has value. So, so that's number one. Number two, uh, what are these things, right? Um, if you kind of take a step back, uh, crypto, well, two steps back, crypto started with, let's say, Bitcoin. And then you have a project called Ethereum, which is basically a smart contracts platform. And, and I think really has nothing to do with, with what Bitcoin's trying to tackle, which is uh, to become a digital substitute for gold and for fiat currencies on a global basis. Ethereum and various other projects like that are really just taking advantage of this trend, this generational theme, this shift away from centralized hierarchies, right? Away from trust of institutions, as you know, as scary or horrible as that may sound, towards you know, power being held by the user. Uh, by the um, by the the voter by by the people right and that is a very um, I think powerful secular trend that's taking place and so what does Ethereum do Ethereum essentially allows for the execution of smart contracts on a trustless basis okay so when once we just kind of establish that layer uh, which of course there could be PhD theses written about that but let's keep moving forward. Uh, one of the uh, questions then when Ethereum first launched 
was, okay, well, what are people going to use this for? I mean, trustless smart contracts, okay. Uh, you know, and so payments uh, were, were part of that. You know, real estate has often been touted as, as something that can be wrapped up into a, a digital contract by NFTs. But what's taken off first is basically digital art, right? It started with CryptoPunks, which I'm sure everybody in, in the audience has heard of, um, which launched in 2017, this little project created 10,000 punks and you could basically just get one for free at the time. And now the top one sold for $24 million. And it's, it's basically like, in my mind, it's sort of like Andy Warhol art. It's, it's just, it's, it's culture, right? It's culture personified in, in digital art form. Um, and so as I was thinking about this, um, you know, as, as we've done quite a bit of thinking and, uh, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a, of a seed round for our NFT fund that we're launching. Um, I thought to myself, like, why, why have these things become so popular? And you know what I hit on? And I think it's a bit ironic, but um, the answer to me anyways, is utility. And you may think like, what sense does that make? These things are not uh, utilizable. They're, they're not usable. But I could just speak personally as an investor, right? And I'm sure a lot of the audience can too. You, you have your stocks and your bonds, and that's important. And Rick, you've guided a lot of people through a lot of those decisions over a lot of years. Um, but what utility do you get out of that? I don't know. Have you been invited to like a Nike VIP event because you held stock? I mean, maybe if you hold it a lot. But really, it's a line on a page. The stuff that you invest in that gives you utility becomes more and more important to you. Um, and usually that's, that's as you grow older and wealthier because you have that ability to diversify into alternative asset classes, such as, well, first of all, there's your house, there's utility there, but you know, classic cars, uh, you can drive them around, you can show them off, fine art. Uh, you know, think about somebody who owns like a sports team or something. I mean, that huge utility there, right? While still being an asset. And so I think that if you, if you kind of work your way through that um, category of investments that offer some kind of utility to the investor um, and you get through to fine art, um, digital art and ownership of the meme culture and the internet culture starts to make some sense, especially when you think about the next generations, right? We tend to think in terms of our own generation, but you know, I have three teenagers and it's a whole new world. So. Uh, you know, we spend 50% of our time online. I mean, this is online right now. Um, it's really closer to 70 uh, for the younger generations. And, you know, uh, COVID didn't help that or it's sort of pushed, increased that number. And owning NFTs is really a function of trying to capture some of that potential art, some of that branding that is occurring at the uh, kind of Web3 level. So maybe I'll just stop there and the, 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 try and summarize that to say, um, I think that NFTs have really exploded in popularity because they're fun, because they're interesting, and because the um, ability to create future brand value from a particular NFT or project is anybody's guess. And so there's a lot of potential there. There's a lot of potential to go to the moon. And of course, the expectation that most of these things will go to zero. And so that's really the conundrum, isn't it, for investors is recognizing, okay, this is brand new. It's come out of nowhere. A year ago, nobody had ever heard of an NFT until Beeple famously sold his art at auction at Christie's for $69 million. Nobody had ever heard of an NFT. Now they seem to be ubiquitous. They're everywhere. All the celebrities, all the athletes, all the recording mm. artists are all launching their own NFTs. Major brands like Nike and Adidas and Burberry, they're all launching NFTs. Uh, every major company in the Fortune 500 is getting in on the game. So clearly there's a there there. But having said that, there is such a proliferation of these NFTs, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of them available worldwide. How on earth do you choose which yeah. NFTs to buy uh, how much do you invest or in them? How do you do all that? Is that are those the kinds of challenges you're trying to solve by launching your fund? This is a hundred percent. You nailed it. So the, you know we um, again coming from sort of the beta index background, 
we used to tout all the time, you know, 80% of active managers fail to beat their benchmark. We know this from the, from the research. Well, there's still a place for active management. Where is that? It's in emerging asset classes where information is asymmetric and it's difficult to get access, right? This is the definition of the NFT space in my mind. That's why I don't think an indexing approach makes any sense uh, in this world uh, for the foreseeable future. I think you need an active manager who knows what they're doing. So we've recruited a team of, of portfolio managers that you know, uh, the, the lead PM has been involved. You know, you can't find anyone that says, oh yeah, I've been trading uh, NFTs for 10 years, right? <laughs> Doesn't exist. <laughs> So, um, so anyways, uh, Justin has, uh, on our side has, um, you know, been in that space for a couple of years, traded thousands of these things. He's a known presence on Twitter. And there's some really interesting aspects to this asset class. So number one, um, projects get more valuable as they become more famous and they get more famous as they become more valuable. You, you have that phenomenon that occurs, right? And so, because of that, uh, people try to, you know, enable their projects or their NFTs to become more well known. And there's IP that's created around it, community, uh, social. These are very generic words, but trust me, there there there's social things that happen online around some of these NFT communities, and they just build buzz and they build value. It's very similar to to the way the art world works. Um, number two, uh, it's 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 a thing now, as you said. Um, because uh, let's call it real people are buying this and establishing it as art. Um, and so our approach is, is pretty straightforward, actually. So we're going to take 80% um, roughly of the fund and invest in what are called uh, blue chip NFTs. But we're going to do so using a qual qualitative and quantitative model. So what does that mean? Um, these things are observable on the blockchain. Um, you can see who owns what. Now you don't know their identity, but you know their wallet address. And you can do a lot of analytics around the momentum building behind a project. Uh, what you don't wanna do is, um, well, this is the opposite of the cocktail party story. The cocktail party story is, hey, I minted this NFT for 60 bucks and sold it six weeks later for 50 grand. I've heard those stories, they're true. I know people that have done that. Uh, however, you don't, you know, for every one of those you hear, you don't hear the thousand other stories where they lost their 50 bucks, right? So um, you can kind of get into that end of the spectrum. That's really not what uh, an institutional fund like, like what we're building uh, is aiming to do. Um, what you need to do is get the projects after they've established themselves. And it's clear that there's some community and some momentum and some consensus around them. And also that the influencers are involved. And when you do a wallet mapping exercise, you can kind of uh, cut the left tail off to a certain extent in terms of backing the wrong projects, um, and then pick the the most blue chip of the of the projects to back, um, and you know maintain that discipline over time. We also have um, mentioned our PM Justin. He's he's a community builder. He actually worked at at StockTwits for was one of the co-founders of StockTwits. And you may think, what does that have to do with with investing? But it's actually building community and, and stoking um, buzz around your holdings is actually fine in the art world. That's something that's uh, not done in the securities world, but it, it is fine in the art world. So it's a, it's a really interesting um, asset class. The last point I'll make about it, and maybe I'm jumping ahead of some of your questions, but I'm, I'm, you can tell I'm excited about this. The, so back to the, the training that we all had in the CFA program, et cetera, what are you looking for? You're looking for uh, an asset class that displays characteristics that are not correlated to the rest of your portfolio. And it's obviously very early days, but one of the interesting things that's emerging with NFTs is as opposed to the rest of crypto, which tends to trade in sync with each other, um, NFTs that are displaying a little bit of a counter cyclical approach. So for example, if you look at, we just looked at this um, the other day, uh, from the start of the year, a 50-50 Bitcoin Ethereum portfolio uh, would be down 17%, I think. Um, a 50-50 uh, uh, CryptoPunks and Bored Apes portfolio, those are the two most popular NFT projects, um, would be up uh, like 6%. So, you know, that's not a huge difference, but 
uh, well, actually, it is a huge difference. If you're talking traditional assets, it's 20, right. 20 plus points. But in the world of crypto, remember, you got to size these things right. But in the world of crypto, that's not a huge difference. But we are starting to observe that these things are a little bit counter cyclical uh, because as crypto tends to sell off, people view this as a, as a buying opportunity for, um, for getting into the NFT project that they were sort of waiting for, if you will. Let's so, talk about the, the portfolio construction. How many positions do you expect to hold and how long do you expect to hold them? So this, this asset class is, um, you know, sort of a mix between... Um, it's, it's definitely not super liquid at this point. So it's more of like a venture portfolio. Uh, we expect to hold these assets, you know, five plus years, uh, depending on, you know, we will be opportunistic. Um, and uh, the number of positions, I mean, you know, uh, 30 to 100 initially, uh, depending on the overall size of the raise and, and growing from there. Uh, what you don't want to do with this, technical point, but there are people out there fractionalizing NFTs and selling portions of NFTs. At that point, you're purchasing securities. And um, so our fund would not be able to take advantage of some of the exemptions that it has. So this is a, this is a hedge fund structure. And I should, I should mention, I don't know if you want me to mention now or, uh, oh, go but ahead. so we, we have um, a seed round closing. We, we were calling it the founders round. This is priced like a hedge fund that, sort of a 2% management fee and 20% performance fee. Um, however, in the founders round that we've been doing to uh, sort of friends and family of, of Osprey, uh, we're, we're waiving half of the performance fee. So it's two and 10, it's closing on the 31st of March. We didn't actually um, figure this out until just, just earlier, but um, you know, Rick has asked if I can keep that open for an, anyone on this call. So if you, if you are interested, you could actually email the investor relations team at Osprey, it's on the website, ir at ospreyfunds.io. And if you get in an indication of interest, but need a couple extra weeks, we'll hold that open, but only if you're uh, you know, registered on this, on this webinar. So uh, just send in an email and we'll, we'll hold that open just for, for folks uh, that registered today as- um, uh, And the minimum here. investment. Rick, who joined that seed round is? It's actually uh, much lower than we'll have on the institutional round when we open that up. It's it's fifty thousand dollars, so it'll probably be two fifty when we reopen for the the main launch in Q two. So, so uh, anyone interested can can do that. The uh, one big question that that someone just asked is, what about custody? How do you handle custody of NFTs? Yeah, that is a that is an emerging field. So. Um, there are, you know, different custody solutions across the, the crypto landscape. Um, right now, the best way that we've found is a, a sharded partial self-custody solution where we have um, a, a portion of the control over the asset in partnership with a, a third party. And um, it's all kind of in the documentation you might, might uh, imagine, but it's, it's not uh, qualified custody. Uh, but it is, we felt the best in class solution out there. So uh, we're, we're partnering with Fireblocks on that. I think this question is about as blunt and uh, uh, valid as it comes. Um, so take it in the context that it is offered. Uh -oh. uh, given this comes from an advisor uh, watching this, given the NFT's speculative nature, is it really something an advisor should be recommending? Um, I wouldn't say an advisor should uh, necessarily recommend NFTs to their, to their client. What I think an advisor should do is consider an allocation to NFTs as an asset class. And, and I would absolutely size it appropriately to the extent you have clients uh, with some space or some interest in their alternative uh, alternatives bucket you know, uh, whatever the minimum size is, a 1% allocation uh, could be considered. I, I do think that um, it's, it probably needs to be driven by um, investor demand. So I, if I, I were an advisor, I would kind of quickly go through which of my uh, people has been asking me about NFTs. I mean, we, we get a lot of that. So people, call, people have called us from the big four advisors 
and say, I could never do this within the system, but I have clients that want access. So where do I send them? How can I do this? Um, so we're happy to try and help those people. This is all direct from the, from the fund company and uh, not through any platforms or whatever. So, um, so I wouldn't say I, I recommend it across the board to every one of your clients. I would say, think through who's been asking you for a solution and uh, that's probably where to start and just see how it develops. Uh, one question is uh, regarding rebalancing. Is the NFT fund going to rebalance on any set schedule? No, uh, it's it's an, you know not an index fund, so there's no set rebalancing. I think we'll try to um, opportunistically pair the positions back that have um, you know grown significantly in value and um, add to the positions where we think that uh, you know prices decreased, uh, but they're still good value. Um, but that will be uh, an actively managed process and very much subject to uh, the um, you know the vagaries of the NFT market. Let me give you one one last cool. Uh, I don't know if we are on time, but I, yeah, we're good. Just a just a, a cool little aspect. So uh, one of the thing, one of the strategies that we're going to employ with a portion of the portfolio is lending against NFTs. And this reminds me of how you know Warren uh, Buffett. Uh, writes out of the money puts to get long the S and P because he figures, you know, if I own the S and P right here, I, I sure as heck own it down ten percent from here, and if not, it's it's free money, right? Um, so, in the NFT market, uh, and this is another one of the use cases that NFTs, uh, art, for example, fine art, just regular art um, at the high end, is wonderful collateral. There's, you know, all the banks will loan against fine art. Um, so it's great collateral for that. NFTs are on their way to becoming, you know, the premier projects are on their way to becoming that in the digital world. And so that marketplace already exists. So we're able to finance um, certain NFTs that maybe we think the portfolio would like to have at 30% below fair market value and earn a rate of interest that in some cases exceeds 50% per annum. Right, that's how that's how early it is. But if we're already bullish on a particular project, we want to own some of that. How about owning it down thirty percent and earning you know fifty percent per annum while you wait? So these are some of the cool little uh, strategies that are available in that space, and uh, we plan to avail ourselves of those. Uh, one advisor asks about uh, uh, the CBOE that um, there's talk that. NFT is going to be viewed as commodities, uh, which would get Chicago board uh, engaged. Do any, mm. any input on that notion? Um, I wouldn't, I, I don't have a fully formed opinion yet on, on that, but um, certainly closer to commodities than they are securities, in my opinion. So talk about overall security. You, know, you mentioned uh, that the custody issue is an evolving environment. There are no qualified custodians yet. Uh, how are you helping to uh, safeguard and, and reduce uh, everything from hacker risk to uh, loss of the uh, asset and so on? Yeah, so, so like I mentioned, we've partnered with, with Fireblocks on the actual solution, uh, which, which involves sharded keys to uh, an Ethereum wallet, which is you know, a, a, a fairly uh, well-accepted and robust kind of security solution at this point in the crypto world. Uh, beyond that, we obviously have um, internal policies, checks and procedures. And with our uh, you know, uh, different locations and won't we'll go into kind of too much of the, of the detail there, but um, we've created a, a set of both external um, requirements and, and policies uh, with our partner, as well as internal to, to preclude any um, any risk to the assets. There's a, a question that came in about your um, friends and family offer. Uh, they tried to go to your website. They mistyped the name. It's IR at ospreyfunds not dot com. Not dot com. Dot .io. io. Yeah. yeah. It's not yeah. dot com. It's dot io. Io. We had to be cool, you know. <laughs> plus, plus dot com was taken. <laughs> uh, IR at ospreyfunds dot ir. Okay, so that's dot, dot io. I'm sorry. Dot I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I
there's still a lot of question uh, that we're getting, you know, here live uh, as we're talking about valuation. You know, you mentioned that you're not going to try to buy an NFT for 50 bucks that in six weeks is worth 50,000 bucks. You're not going to try to do that, mostly because it's impossible to make such a prediction, not because you don't want to make that kind of profit, but just, you know, who the heck knows how to do that? So that's, that's a lottery ticket. So if you're not going for that, that means you're trying to pick uh, NFTs that you can more legitimately, realistically, uh, with a, I'd say, adult, adult sense of maturity, pick a more reasonable uh, NFT. So how do you go about doing that? How do you value not only the current price of an NFT, but the future prospects for it? Yeah, well, I guess those are two different questions. Uh, the, the, you know, the current value. Um, you know, we're we're working uh, with a third party to to help value the portfolio on a on a regular basis. Um, there are uh, in every case uh, observable transactions, right, in the NFTs um, that that we own, or I should say that the the projects that they belong to. So. We'll, we'll, we have a methodology to extrapolate a price from that. As part of the, um, um, I guess, uh, challenge of this asset class though, is similar to, to like venture, where you have made an illiquid investment in a company and it's, it's grown, but you don't know quite how it's valued until you sort of cash out. Uh, ultimately that is, that will be the, the real valuation. And so um, we, um, you know, that, that's in terms of like the existing portfolio. In terms of the future, uh, you know, value that we're projecting onto a particular NFT before we buy it, it's a combination of things. Um, like I say, we have a proprietary model that we've developed on the quantitative side that does combination of scraping through uh, the blockchain itself, but also social media, et cetera, to indicate uh, which products or uh, projects are gathering momentum and what's called consensus around, hey, yeah, this is a real project. This is uh, going to stand the test of time. Uh, there's something called the Lindy effect that I'm sure people uh, may have heard of as it relates to things in crypto, which basically says the longer something's been around, the more uh, it's expected to be around. Uh, Bitcoin's a great example of that. Uh, having been around for 12, 13 years now, I think we expect it to be around for a lot, lot longer at this point. Um, and so all, all of that kind of goes into generating signals for the portfolio managers. Then there's a certain uh, aspect, which is, is just really qualitative and, and you have to be deep in the weeds of, of the NFT ethos to understand and get a feel for which projects are more monetizable down the road in terms of um, community building and social media impact and um, you know which don't. So there, there's definitely a, um, kind of uh, internal uh, view on that based on, you know, what our collective minds think. So given that you must obviously, as you are ruling out certain NFTs as uh, too volatile, too new, too, too lack of liquidity, too, too whatever that you're ruling out as an investment opportunity, wouldn't that conversely suggest that they're short potential? And are you going to short NFTs in, in the portfolio? <laughs> um, we have no plans to short NFTs in the portfolio, but um, I suppose, yeah, if you could, if you could short, um, you know, there, there's probably a few things that, that come to mind. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the documentation, frankly, is written pretty broadly. So we do have the ability uh, to short if we need to, but um, that's not a part of the strategy right now. It's just uh, really designed as a long only fund. And I think if we ever did get into shorting, it would just be around the edges as a, a sort of a pairs trade type of thing. But it, I can't imagine it would be a large part of the portfolio. You had mentioned earlier that, you know, in answer to the, the question of why would an advisor recommend this or, or engage in this? And you said, look, it's, it's not something that is really mainstream and you should do this, you know, uh, with a very moderate extent, what, what percentage of a portfolio would you suggest uh, advisors contemplate for uh, an exposure? Is this a subset in the crypto sleeve of the portfolio or is this separate and distinct from Bitcoin and Ethereum? Great question. Um, 
You know, I think practically speaking, it's probably hard to convince people that this shouldn't be part of their crypto sleeve. Like, oh, don't think about this as crypto. Think about it as part of your art portfolio. Um, but that could be a possibility as well. So I would say that to the extent that folks have an art allocation, um, it could be, uh, you know, 25 or 33% of that. To the extent that folks have a crypto allocation, I would say, um, something like, uh, you know, 20% allocation of the crypto allocation would make sense to me. Oh, you showed our monkey slide. Great. Yeah, I, I couldn't resist. Uh, yeah. So this is <laughs> the monkey slide. Uh, and I think your headline really says it all, that NFTs are fun. And first and foremost, that's how they right. should be treated. But there is a way to treat them seriously as well. Uh, I'm a fan of, of, of the fun that you're creating. Uh, and Thank I you. think it's really innovative. Uh, and certainly worthy of consideration. And clearly there's a whole lot of interest here as advisors are trying to get their arms around this entire crypto conversation, NFTs, the, the, the biggest main thing at the moment, there's a whole lot of other stuff that'll be coming in years to come like metaverse and DAOs and CBDCs, um, but NFTs are here and they're huge and they're unavoidable. And so I think that the fact that you're launching a fund capitalizing on this really, really does speak volume. So Greg King, the CEO, founder of Osprey Funds, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, uh, again, if you would like to reach uh, Osprey, there is the correct website. There we go. Uh, yeah. To talk to your investor relations department, IR at ospreyfunds.io. Uh, and there it is there. And if you want to just learn about the different OTC trusts that Osprey offers, go to Osprey Funds. Dot io. So Greg, thanks so much again for joining us. And if you would like to Thank learn more about this space and what we're doing in the field of uh, financial education in the world of crypto, uh, our big event of the year, June 8 and 9 in Austin, Texas, uh, uh, is DACFP Vision. We're a couple of day event and the highlight, we're going to take everybody to a Bitcoin mining farm. It's going to be a total amount of fun. And you'll see Greg at that event as well. Yeah. And if you really want to show your client that you have obtained the knowledge you need to be able to give them the advice they need, I encourage you to get our certificate in blockchain and digital assets, an online self-study, self-paced course, 13 CE credits, world-class faculty, Scott Stornetta, the co-inventor of blockchain technologies on our faculty, Anders Bronworth of the Boston Fed, uh, uh, Shauna Hoffman, who ran IBM's blockchain business, all on our faculty. The first half of the course, all about the tech. The second half, all about advisors, practice management, the investment thesis, the opportunities, how to construct a portfolio, regulation, taxation, compliance, and most importantly, how do you talk to clients about all this? The course is just $649. You get 13 CE credits. We're also launching eight additional modules this year, optional, but you get eight more CE credits and all of that is for free uh, to those who hold the uh, certificate. So uh, I encourage you to go to DACFP to enroll in the course. And if you wanna help your clients understand this subject, I'm launching in April my new monthly 16 page newsletter covering the five personal finance topics that matter most, including of course, blockchain and digital assets. You can learn about that at uh, thetruthayf.com. And my new book, The Truth About Crypto comes out in May. Uh, and I strongly encourage you to pick up a copy. It's a great book to give to clients to get them up and running. Uh, and knowledge. Well, there are several chapters in it specifically for advisors uh, about uh, compliance, regulation, taxation, uh, and uh, portfolio management. But the book is designed for everybody who has an interest in crypto, whether you're a novice or whether you're a skilled financial advisor. You can order it now at your favorite bookseller, book debuts May 10. Uh, and with that, I'll say thank you very much for joining us on the program. Again, my thanks to Greg. Uh, um, here at uh, Osprey. And again, it is ospreyfunds.io. And Greg King, uh, founder, CEO, happy to answer all your questions. I'm Rick Edelman with DACFP. Thanks again for joining us on the program. I really appreciate it. Have a wonderful rest of your day.